Come on, you do better than that. Come on. Thank you. How many came in to raise, stand to your feet with me this morning. How many came in here to give the Lord honor and glory and praise to his name? But before you do, let's realize why we're doing it. 
So Sunday morning doesn't make sense without Friday. Without Friday, people would think, what are you worshiping about? What are you rejoicing about? What, well, well, the reason that we rejoice, and, and just so you know, there's 52 Sundays a year. This is only but one, but every Sunday we come to lift up the name of Jesus. But one in particular in the springtime is the one that we readily recognize as Resurrection Sunday. And because of that, we go back to Friday where it seemed that Satan had won. It seemed like there would be no hope. And, and the disciples have to go into what is called the dark night of the soul. And we'll deal with a little bit of that in my message later on. But this idea that Jesus would be dead is unthinkable. And they watched the Savior die in front of them, but he didn't stay there. But there was a Saturday where there was nothing. And some of you may be in a situation right now where you've come into this place and something has died and it doesn't seem like anything is going to happen. And Friday doesn't appear like God is on the move or doing anything, but then Sunday came. And ladies, this is important for you because it was in Luke chapter 24 that records that a group of ladies came to the tomb. So it could be said that Sunday sunrise services for Resurrection Sunday are for ladies only. Come on, somebody. <laughs> that the ladies would come and ultimately bring the news to the fellas. Come on, ladies. That was a good place to say amen. You really missed it there. I set it up. It was like a softball. Come on now. And because of that, because of the empty tomb, there were two men that were standing uh, by the side as the ladies had come, the stone had been rolled away, the scripture says. And they asked this question, why do you seek the living among the dead? And there's this idea that Jesus did not stay in the tomb, that he is risen. And because he is alive, you and I are able to stand here and rejoice because of what Jesus has done. So now, give the Lord praise and honor for the resurrection of our Savior. You may be seated if you can this morning. Those of you that are online, we're so welcoming. We're so glad you're here. We welcome you to be a part with us. So listen, for those of you that have a seat back in front of you, there's a card. You'll notice there's a sticker on the seat in front of you. For those of you that are guests or visitors or want to learn more about the church, open your cell phone up and, and use that QR code. And if you're new here, say there's a link that says I'm new. You can click that, give some information on. Same thing online, there's a Q code, QR code there as well. And so for those of you that are in service with us, there is a gift available for you at the registration desk outside in the foyer. So listen, I don't know about you, but I love to get free stuff. Hello, somebody. And so we got some nice gifts for you, for those of you that are there. So listen, and for those of you that want to know more about the church or want to be involved, use that Q code, QR code. It's right there in front of you. Avail yourself to it. Amen? So look, this morning, we're going to start a three-part series that's called Out of Death Comes Life. And we're, and we're really taking this out of the life of Jesus, in particular, a portion of Scripture in John chapter 12. So if you have your Bible there, we're going to camp out there just for a moment of time because there is a prophetic picture and a metaphor for our lives that I think we can draw some truths from this morning. And not only that, but for the next couple of weeks, let's just meditate on John chapter 12 as a group because there's some pretty miraculous things that transpire in that text. But John chapter 12 says this, and Jesus is speaking. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now, I want to go back. Truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. We are the product and the fruit of Jesus, his life being a seed that was ultimately buried in death that was resurrected. But the seed must first be buried. It must first die. And, and I don't know about you, but it's springtime. And um, my wife thinks that at our house, look, I'm from the urban environment of Baltimore. I know nothing about farming. Do you hear me? For some reason, my wife watched these Alaska, you know, up in Nome, these subsistence people that live there, and she thinks we ought to grow our own food. Hello, somebody. I think we ought to get our food from Fred Meyer. That's what I think. And uh, that's where I go get my food. But she wants to plant stuff, and so, you know, we got a little marital discord going on in our house right now that maybe you can help me with. And, and so I brought this, 
as an illustration. This is not what we have in our backyard. No, not in our house. We have these six foot, seven foot long planter boxes that I didn't assemble because I don't know how to construct them. Hello, somebody. You know why I don't know how to construct them? Because I don't want to plant anything. But that's a whole nother story. Um, from, so what I hear from watching YouTube about you people who grow stuff is that you need some dirt. Come on, somebody. Uh, you need some good dirt. And so this is apparently uh, good dirt. Yeah. Uh-huh. And you need some seeds. And so apparently you got to, you know, make these. And, and so somebody, don't you hate when people are just overly technical about stuff? Well, somebody noticed uh, in service, one of our staff members noticed that I don't know what I'm doing, that you don't put all of the seeds in one hole. Randy Landoff, nobody cares. <laughs> just so you know, Randy, nobody cares that I didn't get the illustration 100%. They understood what I was doing. So you put a seed or, okay, let's do it so that Randy will feel better. A few seeds in that hole, and you cover them, and then you make another hole, and you cover them. Yeah, yeah, you get the point, right? And then somebody says something like, um, you need, at my house, by, by the way, you need some chicken fertilizer. I can promise you that I'm not touching chicken fertilizer. This is Coco's farm. She is the farmer in the Dell. This is her deal. I did the rock shoveling. How many of you know that you got to put gravel at the bottom? I didn't know this, that you got to shovel gravel. I don't have a back for shoveling gravel, just so you know. We need marital counseling. But you water it, you fertilize it, you cultivate it, you develop it, and something miraculously happens to that seed as it's buried. As it's buried in this dark place, this place that appears to not have life or light, something miraculously happens to the seed as a result, and something begins to spring forth of life. Out of this death of the seed comes this life. It's a plant, it's a tomato, whatever it is. And you say, well, okay, Pastor Keith, I got you. You and your wife aren't good and in agreement with farming and that type of thing, but what does it have to do with me? Well, wait a minute. It has everything to do with you because every one of you has seeds, plans, purposes, dreams, accomplishments you want to have, things that God has promised you as promises are all seeds that sometimes go into the soil of your life, your heart, and don't come out the way that you had intended them to. They don't spring forth life the way that you had hoped for. In fact, sometimes, like over the last year, your dreams, your purposes, your plans seem to have been thwarted. Everything we had planned last year got thrown up in the air and nothing happened the way that we wanted it to happen. How many of you remember last April when the world got shut down and you couldn't even go outside, the kids couldn't go outside to play, and you became your kid's playmate, teacher, entertainer, all day, every day. You parents, stand up. I'm going to pray for you right now. No, sit down. <laughs> it's, a, it's a blessing your kids survived it. Hello. But everything we planned, everything we had dreamed, everything we had thought was going to happen didn't happen. So what now? It seems like circumstances and situations. Have you ever been in a situation in your life where, where it seemed like every time you turn around, you were being fought in some area of your life? And I always say it this way, that there are usually three fronts primarily that you'll see the enemy open up an attack in your life. So, so the first thing will be maybe it's financial. Last year, there was financial instability and markets and different things. So he'll open up a fight in, in that area financially, that, that while you're trying to fight and figure out how to rob Peter to pay Paul and make the ends meet, take care of the kids and get groceries, and what about the mortgage note? What about the car note? I got you, all of that. And while you're fighting there, there becomes a relational issue between you and somebody you love because there's tension in the house over the finances. So not only do you have a battle going over the finances, but because your wife spent $20 over the agreed upon budget, now y'all fighting about that. Now we got two fronts being waged war on. Then all of a sudden there comes a physical front. Somebody gets her doctor's report. Now you got three fronts all at the same time. And you've heard the saying when people get overwhelmed by circumstances and situations, they say something like this, I feel like I'm being buried. 
being buried alive here in circumstances and situations. And my kids don't serve God the way that I had desired and the way that we had taught them and the way that we had designed and nothing is going the way we had planned it. And we lost a family member. Do you realize that while people were debating about whether the coronavirus, well, or COVID virus was actually real or not, and while people were debating and crying about having to wear masks and distance, people were losing their lives by the millions globally. We got pastor friends of mine that had to give Zoom funerals for people who weren't even able to go into the hospital to visit their loved ones in their last hours. They literally died alone. And we're debating about our rights while people are dying. I would willingly give away my right to freedom to have a mask or not so that somebody else would not get sick even if I didn't feel as strongly about the virus as some other people did because I love my neighbor. Last year was hard. People died. Purposes, dreams, kids that had worked their lives on school and got to their senior year and were not even able to go on a senior trip, weren't, weren't able to walk across stage, had to do Zoom things and it's just been tragic. And all of that has been made us all feel like we got buried, emotionally buried. I don't know about you, but I'm an extrovert. I love people. So I started looking at all my introvert friends who spend their time by themselves anyway. How do you do that? <laughs> Last year was hard. Come on, extroverts. Social people, people that need to be connected. We felt buried. Alive indeed. But, 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 but. What if out of darkness, what, what if out of death, what if, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute, wait, wait, maybe in all of that chaos, in that darkness, in that death, comes life? What, what if God is not intending that that be an ending, as you might have supposed? but that it is really the rebirth. Maybe, maybe last year what you found was that you were having Jesus plus some things, that you had Jesus plus your girlfriend or Jesus plus a good job or Jesus plus whatever. And I always say it this way, Jesus plus anything equals nothing. But Jesus plus nothing gives you everything. And last year, watch this, last year, all of our, 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 our idols got turned over. All of them were proven to be incapable of saving us, not worthy of our worship. And all of a sudden, when you got everything cut off, and you said, we sing songs normally about Jesus alone and Jesus at the center, but it wasn't until last year when we were left with only Jesus that we were reminded again that Jesus is indeed more than enough. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap this morning. What if I'm a seed? Did you ever think for a moment that you, indeed, your life and your circumstances, that, that you're a seed, that maybe God wants to bring revival in your family and you're the seed, that, that you, you come to church this morning, you're like, man, I wish, how many of you have some loved ones and some friends that you would love to have on your row right now that aren't here, late, wave at me right now? Okay, what if God is using you and your life and your relationship with him as an illustrated sermon for somebody who would never come to church and listen to me. But because of your life and because of your proximity in their lives, they recognize who you are and you have influence over them and they're watching you follow Jesus. And they're watching not just the good highlights. Come on, somebody. You know how IG is. We, we love Instagram, so we always want the right picture with, with, <laughs> with, with the right pose. You know, whenever, whenever you got to take pictures, I got my daughters, they're starting to whip their hair and do all kinds of stuff, and then they're like, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> and I'm like, come on, give me a break, right? It's like, give me my lipstick right, you know, before I put a picture on IG, because why? IG is all about the highlights. But, but here's the funny part. People don't learn about God from your highlights. They learn about God through your night seasons. Because anybody can put their highlights up. 
But what I want is a generation and a church that will say, yep, I went through it. I had the miscarriage. I lost my job. I lost my house. I lost almost my mind. I almost lost my marriage. But out of death has come life. And because he lives and there's resurrection power available, I'm yet alive and standing. Now, if you're going to praise him, go ahead and praise him the right way. Come on. What if you're a seed, like my brother-in-law was a seed for our family that gave his life to the Lord. All of us were heathens, perverted, broken. Coco and I have been separated multiple times. There was so much brokenness in our life, no trust between us, nothing, no hope left for us. And because he was a C and fought through the first circumstances of his life and brought the gospel to his sister and to his aunt and to others, I am your pastor today because somebody was a C and an illustrated sermon that I could watch even when I didn't have the Bible, even when I didn't come to church. Their lives were a written epistle lived in front of me. I saw God's love through his eyes. I saw God's grace through the way that he treated me. I saw God's patience <laughs> through the persecution that I had in his life. I was a persecutor of the faith at one time. And my brother-in-law swept all of us into the kingdom of God as a seed. Oh, by the way, he had some disappointments. He had, um, he had issues that got buried in his life, accomplishments, things that he wanted to work out a certain way that didn't. But he was a seed. And out of death sprung life. And now I can be up on a stage preaching and my granddaughter can be in children's church and my whole family can be on the front row. My whole family is right there on the front row. And here's what I say to you about that is that God is no respecter of person. What he did for one man, he must do for every man. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap right now. Can I take you back to the day that hope died for the disciples? I'm going to take you back about 2,000 years, roughly, when these disciples who had cheerfully started following this teacher, this Messiah, this Jesus, they had, every Jewish boy would have known and heard the history about a coming and all of the prophecies about a coming Messiah who would lead Israel back to prominence, lead them out from underneath at this time, Roman occupation and persecution. They were oppressed severely, overtaxed, all kinds of things were, they were subject to because of the Roman Empire. And you all you have to do is a little bit of study to realize how treacherous and torturous and debaucherous this empire was. And so now these disciples had found the Messiah, the one that would lead Israel out from underneath of all of these circumstances. And they start following him. And maybe when he first calls them, they really don't understand everything because they never really do anyway. But Keith, they start following him and he starts doing miracles. People are fed, wine is turned, water is turned into wine. People are raised, woman, a woman with an issue of blood for years and years is healed. Blind men are opened eyes. All of these miracles are happening. This is the one. And they follow him for three years. And, and then toward the end of his life, he starts talking funny. He starts talking really morbidly about leaving. And it's necessary that I would go to the Father so that the Spirit would come to you. And, and where I'm going, you can't go. And, and I'll build a place there, a mansion for you there. And I'll receive you there. And they start talking about, wait a minute, where are you going? What are, you, what are you talking about? They never really grasp it and understand it. Then they watch him die. That's the day hope died for them. Everything they would have expected. You, you got to imagine. Come on now. Now listen, you can't, you can't just read the scriptures deadly. You got to interact with it. You, you got to be in the moment. You, you're a Jewish person. You're, you're, you're living under Roman occupation, and somebody is saying there's a Messiah, and dead people, and Lazarus is coming out of the grave, and all this good stuff is happening, and you're saying, finally, finally, we're going to get set free. And, and you're waiting 
for his triumphal entry, which is Palm Sunday, Sunday, and you're waiting for him to come in, and he comes riding in, not on a white steed and a sword in his hand with an army behind him. He comes in on a donkey with palm branches, not rose petals, palm branches laid down and clothing from the poor as a saddle. Okay, so there's no army? Where's Maximus and the rest of your army? How many of you remember the gladiator with Maximus on the white horse and the sword? Come on, I'm, I'm looking for that. I'm looking for Mel Gibson in Braveheart to ride up and down the line. You know what I'm saying? Come on, somebody. Come on, Jesus. This is a Roman Empire. What are you doing? Jesus didn't come to overthrow the Roman Empire. He came to overthrow the evil that would be behind every empire and all of the evil effects that would, bring, that would be brought into your life. Come on, somebody. Jesus came to defeat death, hell, and the grave, and all of the demons of hell were put on notice that out of death, when his resurrection, out of death has come life, and that he is indeed who he said he was, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Come on, give the Lord a big hand clap. But the disciples were confused. And in fact, in John chapter 16, Jesus is talking to the disciples once. Kat, he said, I have many things to tell you, but you are unable to bear them. They didn't have the capacity to understand what he was saying. And oftentimes we're the same way. We, we need revelation. We need the Holy Spirit to help us to understand what it is we're reading in the scriptures and what God is doing. And so they reached what I call or what John the monk John of the Cross in the 16th century who wrote a poem called The Dark Night of the Soul. They enter what is called the dark night of the soul. It is not just a depressing day. It is not just one event. It can be an event that's triggering this event inside your soul, but it is much deeper and the despair is much deeper than just I had a bad day. A dark night of the soul comes when in one frame triggered by some external event, it could be a premature death, be the death of a child, the death of a spouse. Prematurely, it can trigger a dark night of the soul, that the despair of your life. Why? Because what you had previously given meaning, life gave your life meaning and all that you had hoped for and all that you had dreamed for and everything collapses in one frame. It triggers what John of the cross would call the dark night of the soul. But can I tell you that what we have found as we journey, what I've found when I've journeyed with the Lord, is out of the dark night of the soul, a death of all that has transpired previously, can emerge a stronger faith, can emerge a stronger individual, a, and as indeed a transformed man or woman out of what should have destroyed you. Why? Because we recognize there's nothing that's going to be able to separate us from the love of God, that even in death, life has the victory because death, hell, and the grave has no hold on us. And because of that, because of the resurrection of Jesus, no matter what is dead, no matter what is failed, no matter what is broken, it can live again because of him. dark night of the soul is when what we have built our lives on collapses and is destroyed right in front of us. For a lot of people that happened to them last year and they're still trying to recover from it. Economically, emotionally, everything collapsed. The things that they had held on to, the things that they had dared to ascribe glory to failed. And we were left with our mortality listening to case counts and death tolls and wondering if we could even go to Costco to get toilet paper when there wasn't any. Come on, somebody. <laughs> we walk through the dark night of the soul. And out of this will come new life, just the same way it did for the disciples. And, and can I read to you their response to the dark night of the soul that they were having? In John chapter 21, it's a classic portion of Scripture, but I want to read it to you this morning. It says this. In John chapter 21 and verse 1, it says, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples 
at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. So it's a group of them, a little cohort. Simon Peter said to them, now this is supposedly the rock and the foundation of the new church. He ain't there yet, but he's going to get there. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Now, there's nothing wrong with going fishing. And um, I fish at Fred Meyer. Hello. <laughs> nothing wrong with it. And so if you want to take me out fishing and you think I'm going to sit out on a boat for eight hours and maybe catch a fish, you crazy. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to go where I got a 100% chance of getting me a piece of salmon. And that's at the, I know what aisle that is at Fred Meyer. How many know what I'm talking about? Y'all cracking up. Y'all. <laughs> Somebody, let's see, you know what's going to happen, Coco. Somebody going to email me. I know the right fishing hole and I'm going to take you and you're going to catch a fish. No, I'm not. Because, number one, I don't like water because black people don't float, just so you know. That ain't no stereotype. I go straight to the bottom. Better get me some floaties. I ain't ashamed. I'll wear them, too. You see, I got a pink shirt on. I don't care. Peter says, I'm going fishing. You know what he's saying? Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 had already called them away from fishing. They were fishermen by trade. And, and he said, hey, by the way, I no longer want you to be fisher, fishermen. I want to make you fishers of men. And so what they're basically doing, because you know what happens with us. Whenever things don't work out the way that we had intended, whenever, whenever our plans don't happen, whenever we don't get married when we thought we'd get married, have a child when we thought we would. I met a lady here just recently who's been married 10 years, and she hasn't had one baby yet. She said, we keep trying. We try all the time. I'm like, good girl. You know. <laughs> They married. She let me know that they were healthy, and I was like, good. But they hadn't had one. And, you know, they got friends around them, you know, fertile myrtles in that group. She done had seven or eight of them, and she just wants one. Things haven't worked out. So you know what normally happens to us when things don't work out, Zach? We go back to something or someone that God has called us away from, weaned us away, that's not fruitful, that doesn't give life, that doesn't promote God's purposes in our life, and God won't derive glory for them, and we go backward. Because how I many realize there's only found, that John chapter 4 said living water is only found in one place. That's Jesus. The woman by the well found out that Jesus is the only place where there's satisfaction, not pacification, satisfaction. Most everything in our lives only offers a temporary relief. It is only in Jesus where your soul's thirst is quenched eternally. And we get baited out of going backwards. And so this is what happened with the disciples. They went back to doing what they had previously known to do to find comfort. Instead of journeying forward with God. How many know there's always something else in him? Uh, there's five of you over here. Let me talk to y'all. They, they fell asleep over there. Come on. How many recognize there's always another level, another step, there's always more in God than what you've experienced? All you need to do is step out in faith and trust him, get out of your box called your comfort zone, and move out with God, and you will receive the adventure of a lifetime as you pursue him. They go fishing. I'm going fishing. And then they said, we're going too. We're going with you also. Because you always take people with you, no matter whether you like it or not. You're an influence on somebody. Somebody's watching you, and they will follow your example. If you all of a sudden pop up and say, I'm going to serve God, I'm going to church every week, guess what will happen? Somebody will follow you as well. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I, I was thinking back. I'm going to read the rest of this text in a second. But I was thinking back to my first couple of weeks in church. When I first gave my life to the Lord, I was in Oceanside, California, and I was still a Marine. And I went to church to let people not, let them know not to bother me, because I stood in church like this. I, I was like this in, on my row, just like this. Because you know why? I wanted them to know, don't come over here, don't hug me, don't bring any of that laughter and joy over to me, I'm fine. Don't bring any of that Jesus stuff over here. Hey, you going to hug what? You better step off, man. <laughs> and then after a couple of weeks, you know, I you know, loosened up a little bit. I figured uh, nobody was going to pickpocket me. Nobody's after my wife there. Hello, somebody. My wife was too excited to go to church every Sunday. 
I'm like, oh, we're going to church. And you smell good, look, oh, real happy today. I'm going down to the church. I want to see what's going on. I want to see who you meeting down there. She's talking about she meeting Jesus. I want to see Jesus Christo too. <laughs> Let me see that joke up in here. On my row. For too long, I was like this in church. Stayed in church the whole time, just like this, waiting for it to pop off. Where you at, Jesus Christo? <laughs> before long, the Lord got a hold of my heart, and before I knew it, this hard Marine was crying. My kids will tell you, it's a, it's a mess right now. I used to not cry over nothing, and now I cry over everything. It's like the Lord got a hold of my heart, transform me. I'm just a big bag of mush. I'm a tender warrior, though. Fight for the right things now. The Lord transformed me in the same way that these disciples are going to find themselves being transformed. It says, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. You know why they caught nothing? Because you're never going to catch nothing in your life worth having apart from Jesus. You will not find satisfaction. You will not find significance. You will not find the joy that will last very long. I'm not saying that there isn't some joy in things in this earth apart from God, but what I'm saying to you is it will not be joy unspeakable. It will not be eternal. You will not find significance in it. There is only life in one name. His name is is what? Jesus. His name is what? Jesus. Yes. Yes. Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? In other words, do you have anything to show for your labor? They answered no. Hmm. I'm so glad that Jesus actually initiated that conversation because what that says to me is in my brokenness, in my wanderings, I can count on the shepherd of my soul to come after me. How many of you have found yourself wandering away from the Lord, getting away from the things of God, only to find Jesus come sometimes where Christians won't go to retrieve you? Come on, give the Lord a hand clap. Come on. Come on. You know that's right. Transformation. You know, and this idea of being raised from the dead, I saw a tattoo. I like tattoos. And um, I saw one that caught my eye. And it's, it's this caterpillar that's halfway in a cocoon. And I started thinking about transformation because out of death comes life. And this idea of the Holy Spirit, Jesus saying in John chapter 14, I believe it was 16, he says, hey, it's necessary that I go away to go to the Father so that the Spirit would come to you. And because the Spirit of God lives in us, I, I, I hope you recognize that the Spirit of God lives inside you, the same Spirit that created everything that exists and the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. When you name the name of Jesus as your Savior, that when you became born of the Spirit, born again, that Spirit took up residence within you. So it doesn't matter whether you have a personality like mine and a big mouth and audacious personality, or whether you're a petite, little, 120-pound, timid little soul, there's a lion down on the inside of you. It is the lion of the tribe of Judah. It is Jesus, and if you would just let him loose in your life, you would roar as a lion. Transformed. People look at you and say, I can't believe that's you. Can't believe I remember you back in the day, but look at you now. Look at you, you're free from drugs, free from insecurity, free from people's opinion. Come on, somebody. Free from past failures, free from perversion, free from it all. In Christ, whom the Son of Man sets free is free indeed. So I'm a new creation. And this caterpillar, fat little plump thing, goes into this cocoon, and you, you got to see this stuff. I, I love National Geographic. Me and my daughter watch it all the time. I love this stuff. And he goes in and literally falls apart, decays, liquefies, and is reconstituted as a beautiful butterfly on the other side. That is called a metamorphosis, complete change of form. This is what God is doing in your life and in all of our life, and potentially in the lives of those that will name the name of Jesus, that you literally take on a completely different life, a different form in him. Can I get every head bowed and every eye closed just for a moment of time? Online as well, can you just focus in right now? Don't put the dishes away. Don't worry about lunch. Maybe... You came here by invitation, somebody invited you because 
about 90% of people that ever give their life to the Lord at a service come by invitation of somebody that they trust. Or, or maybe you just came on your own and you said, well, man, I just decided I was going to check it out. Well, I, I just want to let you know that technically you are being drawn by the Spirit of the Lord here to hear this message on this particular day. That God spared you, and some of you, there's somebody here right now that could testify to this, that God spared you from your life, from death on multiple occasions. And you find yourself sitting right now in a service clothed in your right mind because God spared you. But you're not in right relationship with the Lord right now. You've backslidden away from him. Life sort of had its way with you. You lost your sense of priorities and value for the things of God. You don't have time for it. Life tricks you into being deceived into thinking that you could live a life apart from God. That you can just come in and just visit every so often. But you don't have to live with him daily. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus did not die for you to visit him occasionally. That he died because he wanted to give you life and life more abundantly. That he overthrew the, the, the works of the devil so that you might be free from it. So that you could serve and bring God glory. If you're here this morning, you say, you know what? I've been living in a dark night of the soul for a long time. When you started talking about that, Pastor Key, that resonated with me. I need a Savior. I need Jesus more than I need anything else in my life. I need Jesus. Online, you're saying, I need Jesus. If that's you, signify that with an uplifted hand. Nobody looking around. Just say, Pastor Keith, would you pray for me? Lift your hand right now all over the building. I see your hands going up. I see your hands going up. I see your hands going up. I see your hands. If you had your hand up right now, look up at me. Did you mean it? Right there in the black. You mean it? You mean it back there? You mean it right here, right here? You mean it? What about back here? You mean it? Okay, so here's what I want to do. I'm going to jump down here right now, and I want to pray for you personally. Would you come and meet me here? Don't worry about the people. Don't worry about the walk. Just meet me right here, right now. Just come on. Come out of your seat. Meet me right now. Face me. Turn around. Face me. Come on, you do better than that. All of heaven is rejoicing. There's still some others coming. It's an important day. It's an important moment. I can remember the moment in my own life. And every time I'm standing in the altar, I'm reminded of that moment. All that was going on in my life. I still had questions about how God was going to work it all out and what he was going to do and how he was going to do it. Because I was still trying to be God. Instead of just surrendering, saying, okay, I've made a mess of things. I'm just going to surrender to you and trust you by faith. I was tired. My soul was tired. And the dark night of the soul had done its business on me. And I could see no way out. And in fact, that Sunday when the pastor did exactly what I'm doing right now, he had said before I even got up out of my seat, he said, somebody here has contemplated suicide, contemplated taking your life. Nobody, I hadn't even told Coco. Nobody knew that but God. I knew I was in the presence of God. And I didn't care about all the people in the audience because none of them were my savior. None of them had died for me, so I didn't care about their opinions. I remember that moment like it was yesterday. It changed everything for me. And it'll change everything for you. Here's what I'm not going to do any longer. I don't give people prayers at the altar. I'm going to tell you a few things. One, that by coming out of your seat, what you are saying is that you believe that Jesus Christ is the only savior for the sins of humanity. And personally, you are saying, what's your name? Stephanie? You're saying, I receive Jesus as my savior now. Not the world's, not out there. This is for me today, personally, individually. Does that make sense? And that from this day forward, by the Spirit, he will empower you to live for him and to throw off everything that's plaguing your life. I got it. Everybody's got stuff, by the way. You're not unique. Everybody's got stuff. 
I got my own. It's just that we're forgiven and we go to the Lord because he cares for us and we cast all of that stuff on him and he sorts it out. He works it out and he works it in us too because some of it works to refine our character. Amen. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to bow your head, close your eyes and just pray the best way that you can to ask the Lord to forgive you the sin in your life, the rebellion against him. Ask him to cleanse you from all sin and unrighteousness and let him know that you're going to live for him from this day forward as he empowers you. Church, stretch forth your hands this way and pray for each one of them right now. Come on, open your mouth and begin to pray. Pour your heart out before him. Tell him, I'm going to live for you from this day forward. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to stay put in this church so they can help me grow. I made a decision today. It's an eternal one. I'm going to serve you, Lord, for the rest of my days. Amen. Amen. Look up at me. There's, there's a bit of chaos that I see behind you, just spiritually speaking. Stuff going on. Here's what I want you to know. You don't have to fight those battles. I, I can feel you trying to fight it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to fight anymore. What's your name? Crystal, you don't have to fight. You've been fighting a long time for everything. Fighting for your voice. Fighting for your place. You don't have to fight anymore. Your heavenly father is going to be there for you. Mm -hmm. There's a little girl in you that needs to be picked up. That God's saying, I'm your father. I am your father. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm going to pick you up. You're going to be the apple on my eye. That's why I hear the Lord saying to you right now. Be at peace. That's what the father says. Be at peace. You can feel it even washing over you right now. You didn't intend this to happen to you. Now look at me. I don't know you, do I? Is this making sense to you? Yeah. You know who does know you? knows every hair on your head, knows every tear you've cried, is your heavenly father. And this morning, he brought all of this to bear so that you and you and you and you and you and the others and all this service might know him and might serve him. Amen? So here's what I say to you. So here's the next thing. There's some people against the wall there. If you'd like somebody to spend a few moments just praying with you, that's all. They would love to do that with you. If you say, you know what, I got some stuff going on in my life, I'd love to take a few minutes with somebody personally and have them just agree in prayer. You can tell them as much or as little as you want and they'll pray for you. But I want all of you, that whether you go over there or you go back to your seat, I want you to open your phone immediately, get that QR code and hit, I said yes. Fill it out. He said, I already did. <laughs> he, boy, he came up here. He already did. <laughs> Come on, make sure you fill it out. That'll be the only way that we can connect with you because we need to start helping you grow and you need a place and a family to belong to, amen? Come on, give them a big hand as they go. Thank you, going back to your seat. Well, go get prayer, Q card, QR code. Send to your feet with me all over the building. Send to your feet with me. Those of you online, if you said yes to Jesus, type in the chat, I said yes. And then our team will immediately spring into action for you as well. So listen, here's what I want you to do. I say it every week. Every week before we leave, I say it. I want you to continue, please, to invest in relationships and invite people to God's house. Why? Because sometimes somebody like me in your life who's been a persecutor and ignoring your faith for years and years, God will arrange the circumstances as such if you'll be faithful and patient for that seed to spring root, you never know when you might ask them to come, they say yes. But if you don't ask, they don't have the opportunity. So keep investing in relationships and do not ever be content with coming to church alone. Save seats. Start praying and saying, God, I want this row in my church. I want all my friends on this row. I want my coworkers, my cousins. And start, I used to pray over the chairs that I wanted filled in church. Make sure you do crazy, radical things, but invest in relationships and invite people to come to God's house with you. Go with God. God's going to go with you. We love you.
of the four services, but hey, each service was so powerful. Hey, if you said yes to Jesus for the first time or rededicated your life back to him, we want to congratulate with you. We want to say welcome to the family of God. Welcome to the East Hill family. Hey, really quick, we, we've had Stephanie who said yes to Jesus. We had Jack who said yes to Jesus. Uh, Jesse, uh, Ashley. Sierra, John, all said yes to Jesus. If you're still wanting to say yes to Jesus and you want to connect with us so we can lay out some of those next steps, the QR code is on the screen. Go ahead and open up your, your photo app, hover that QR code, and you would instantly get connected by clicking on the I said yes to Jesus icon. Man, we have had so much fun. Jesus has done so much in all four of our services. But hey, guess what? There's still more to come because we are going to continue to look more like him and then we want to get out into the community and share the love of Jesus with everyone that we come in contact with. So we love you guys so much. Again, if you're saying yes to Jesus for the first time, you could go ahead and text, that, text the word Jesus to the number 503-483-6966 or scan that QR code and a family member is on standby to jump out and, and reach out to you and just continue to build a relationship from the beginning. And so we love you guys so much. Enjoy the rest of your week. We'll see you next Sunday.